Hello everyone, welcome to the next episode of the Roker Report. I'm joined once again off, well, this time it's not off the back of a victory, sadly, it's off the back of a loss, but nevertheless a loss that we can take some uh, some positives from, hopefully. Anyway, yeah, I'm joined again by Tom. How are you doing, Tom? Good, mate. How are you? Yeah, not bad. I'm getting by. And Callum, you're here today? I am, yeah. I'm feeling that good. That was a question, was it? You're here today. <laughs> James, well, how are you getting on, mate? I'm all right, mate. I'm all right. Good. And Gav, finally, last but not least. How are you doing? Feel, feeling freshly bathed. I've just come out with a lovely warm bath just to talk to you, lads. <laughs> so, a soapy warm bath. <laughs> yeah. But that's for, that's I, for another it, podcast altogether. Well, it's, it's better than a bath of acid. It was a bath of, <laughs> of bubbles and, and nice baby oil and things like that. So I'm feeling good. Right, yo. Yeah, so after the back of this defeat... Um, yeah, I think we can all agree that it was always going to be a hard-fought match and no one reasonably went in there thinking, yeah, it's going to be an easy three points or even that it's going to be a probable three points or even a possible three points. I mean, what did you make of the game, Tom? It's a really tricky one. Um, I don't know. I thought maybe I thought maybe we'd actually get beat quite heavily, to be honest, like reality-wise. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we played really well for 75 minutes. And it's kind of, I don't want to say I came away disappointed that we didn't get something from the game, but there was definitely an opportunity. So on one hand, that's a positive because I think actually we totally did the opposite of what I expected. We didn't crumble and ship six goals like a couple of teams have against Liverpool this season. Mm. But on the other hand, we played so well. I just felt like a little bit, I don't want to say frustrated. I don't want to say disappointed because they're two harsh words, but it's just like a little bit, a little bit down that I thought we really could have done a little bit better. I don't know if frustrated is too much of a hard word. I mean, I felt exactly the same after that. I think I think it's compounded almost by playing well for 75 minutes and being so resilient for that amount of time. And you, it's the hope that kills you, isn't it? It's that, that's yeah. what you, you start to think maybe we can hold on to this. Maybe, I mean, there are a couple of opportunities there. Some shots that certainly went wanting. Some opp- Certainly some opportunities at least. Nothing clear cut, but something that a player like Defoe or arguably even what more could have made more of. Mm, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I think... I think there was a moment, possibly at half time, where I felt that uh, that we really had them rattled to a, to an extent that I'd not seen Liverpool rattled this season. Um, mm. And it wasn't because we were we were getting at them, but uh, the the fact we were so resilient and strong and and weren't letting them play through us like they have so many times against other teams. Uh, the fans were getting on that case in the end, and it got to a point where Jurgen Klopp decided. To, rampage up and down the line, throw his arms about and try and get the crowd involved again because he, he knew that they were turning on the players and that wasn't a good thing and I suppose that's that's what a world class manager is there for. I mean he's not a he's not a cheerleader or anything, but he he certainly did enough to turn the crowd back around and the players got refocused and made us pay effectively. The, the it was a very well well taken goal the first one and you know all your momentum's gone then, isn't it? When when you when you've defended so well and, and you finally succumb to a to a goal like that, where a lot of people said it was a cross, but regardless, he put it into an area where we weren't going to be able to defend that, and it mm. and it went in the back of the net. So you know, I I, I think I think that we've got to we've got to just scale it back, and we've got to kind of remember that um, this was Liverpool we were playing at Anfield, who are many expect will be up there for the title. Um, many expect us to struggle, possibly be relegated, and the gulf in class between that top four uh, or five clubs is is probably bigger in difference between us and them, and maybe the top of the championship and the bottom of league too. That the gulf in class is huge, and we we at least turned up with a with a game plan and and looked half decent at, at times, maybe. Um, maybe even looked like we had a bit of confidence, which is what gives me hope, at least. Yeah, I'd agree with you, mate. I thought we were, I thought we were really decent. I, I certainly went into the game expecting, fully expecting to get beat. You know, Liverpool have been fantastic this year. They look brilliant under Klopp. Uh, they play with a lot of pace. But we, we frustrated them. We looked compact. We looked like, a, I hate to say it, we looked like a David Moyes Everton side. I mean, um, the, one of my mates who's an Everton fan was saying that, you know, we were um, we reminded him very much of 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 a Moises side under um, under them, and I just I just it does give you a bit more hope that if this program sorry losing Liverpool you mean yeah yeah <laughs> no, it, no it gives you hope that if we can progress you know consistently like this we can remain hard to beat then you know 
we certainly can stay up this year and we certainly can keep keep progressing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've been saying that we want, you know, solid, organised uh, performances with effort. And, you know, the, that was definitely there. You know, as you said, we were very compact. Um, we had a game plan and we stuck to it. We didn't play good football. We didn't, ent- we didn't go out to entertain and, we you know, therefore we didn't entertain. Um, but we shouldn't apologise for that. I mean, like you said, the golfing class is huge. And if we go there and we try and say, right, well, we're going to have more possession than you, or we're going to play, uh, we're going to press high up the pitch. You play into their hands. So you know, frustrating teams like that is 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 what teams like us have to have to go out and do. And so I can't I can't complain because I've been saying that what I want to see is effort and what I want to see is organisation. And and I I got that. So you know, that's absolutely fine. We need to play within our means and play to our strengths. And and uh, for for a significant period of the game, we did that. My one complaint would be that um, the the game plan was 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 good, but you should have seen um, uh, Pinar's performance as, as not good enough. He was he was significantly off the pace of the game. He's given the ball away, and if you give the ball away to teams like Liverpool, particularly in your own half, ultimately they're going to punish you one way or another. And mm. managers have to be not only set up a game plan from the beginning of the game, but in the game, they have to impact upon the game. And they have a responsibility to change things when they see something going wrong. Pienaar's performance was just not good enough. And there were options on the bench for him to change it. But because it was nil-nil and because he thought, oh, well, it hasn't happened yet, it hasn't happened yet, I'm not going to change it. And then when you go one nil down, he makes the changes. It reminded me very much of last season when uh, against Leicester. Allardyce didn't make the change when we were losing the midfield battle. We concede the goal and he makes the changes. And then the next game against Norwich, he sees Kasri's performance in the first half. And even though we're 1-0 up, he takes Kasri off because he recognises that Kasri's not doing a good enough job. Brings on Watmore. And, and even though we're winning, even though things are going our way, he, ha- he made the brave decision to make a change. And we saw Ranieri do that last season. The, the best managers in the league who get the results make brave decisions and, and not oh, yeah. obvious decisions. And that, that was my, that's my complaint, is that you know, for, the, for a significant portion of this season, we've been saying that David Moyes' decisions in games are head scratches and we don't understand what he's trying to do. Two wins doesn't change that for me. You know, uh, one, you know, the decision to play an each be on the uh, wide and it coming off, you know, Ultimately, he's still accountable for each decision in each game. And in this game, he got it wrong, in my opinion. Well, I, I have to agree with... I mean, you've really sort of broached two questions there, second one towards the end. But for your first point, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that not enough is made of the uh, tactical responsibilities on managers during games, uh, the, or of managers during games. I, I personally thought that. I thought that doing anything... Um, especially looking at Pienaar's performance for the first half, which we can all agree was absolutely abysmal, I'm sure, and I'll, we'll go back to that for a moment. But, yeah, I, I thought he should have made that change. Who it should have been or whether that person would have directly led uh, or given a key pass, for example, got an assist, scored a goal or made an important interception or block on the line or anything like that isn't so much the point for me. It was about seeing... I mean, you your team's only as strong as its weakest team member, isn't it? It's only as strong as the weakest link. So if you're going to keep a player like that on, knowing that he's had a really terrible performance, but believing that, I don't know, somehow maybe because he has a, pro, a history with Pina, yeah. when he thought that he could, he, could have a, he could have a chat with him at half-time and he'd sort of sort himself out. But even then, after, like, it, it, it was too long. A lot too of, little too late as well. A lot of people did actually think Pina seemed to play well. Like I looked at a few of the match <laughs> ratings, I think maybe from the Mirror or someone, they, they actually said he was Sunderland's best player. Um, uh, the, the mirror said yeah. let's flock out and buy the, the fact, mirror the fact that we did the greatest <laughs> performance I mean it speaks volumes I think maybe from a Sunderland fan's perspective maybe it was the fact that he, he looked a bit slow um, looked a bit off the pace but to play devil's advocate if David Moyes had, had changed the game at nil nil and brought on someone like say a Larson or a Lyndon Gooch and then conceded would we be then saying look we but, were at nil nil well, should we have kept it I, tight I don't, I don't think that Anyone could could argue that uh, David Moyes should have let if, if he'd taken Pinar off and then we'd conceded a goal. I don't think anyone could have argued that uh, he was that that it was it was wrong to take uh, Pinar off. I mean, 
of course, we, it's it's all hypothetical, and we can all kind of say, well, if he'd made the change, we might have been a bit more of a threat going forward. We might have had a bit more energy going back. We might not, you know, you, you, obviously you don't know. But at the same time, I look at David Moyes' decisions in games, and a lot of them to me seem to be based on, well, nothing's gone wrong yet, so I'm just going to leave it and leave it and leave it. And it was like Anichibi last week. Anichibi's injury history is catastrophic, and he's out. He's, he's blowing out his arse at 60 minutes, begging to come off. <laughs> and and, we're, and we're, we're, you know, we're winning 2-0, and you're thinking, well, why not just take the lad off? But he leaves him on and leaves him on. And it came off for him, like, fair enough, 3-0. But for me, it was a risk that didn't need to be didn't need to be taken. And he just... I don't understand some of his decisions in the games. I don't... I don't. I think he's too afraid sometimes to make changes. No, I, th- I, think he's, I think he's. I think he's very loyal to PNR. That's quite clear. Um, and maybe that's what it is. He's he's kind of worked enough with him over the years to be able to give him some leeway when he's playing badly. Um, but at the same time, I have to reluctantly agree with what you're just saying. Um, it was quite clear he had to leave the pitch. At, 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 at maybe after 20, 30 minutes, I was. I was looking at him thinking he's got to come off soon because he was just costing us possession so much. And it was like, it was like the reason he, he was playing uh, and the reason he plays in centre of midfield, we are told, is because he's so good at holding on the ball and he didn't do a great job of that. But um, as the game progressed, it was quite obvious that um, he was just being given, given extra time by the manager because maybe he's got a bit of faith in him. But I suppose the true test of faith will be... Um, Next week, when when we play, and he's going to have presumably a fit Larson and a fit Kirchhoff available for selection. He'll start. Whether he whether he chooses to to, to drop Pien or in favour of one of those players who aren't his players, you know what I mean. So it's mm. it's going to be interesting that because um, <clears throat> with the under twenty threes playing midweek again, um, it's another opportunity for those players to get some minutes under their belt, and if and they impress like well in, yes, in, in the same yes. group. Um, and I suppose um, Moyes will attend that game, and if he sees what he likes, to see, well, if he sees enough from that, he, he may well uh, change things around. But I just find that David Moyes is quite a loyal person. You can kind of tell that from from the, the signings he's made. Mm. Um, maybe it's his downfall at times as well, like we've seen at the weekend. But uh, look, it's going to be it's going to be tough for him not to make changes in the centre midfield next week because even though um, we beat Bournemouth and we beat Hull I would probably admit in both of those games that the midfield weren't particularly used going forward, they were more um, they were more pedestrian and we had to hit over them to an each of and things like that you know and, yeah. and it would be nice it was... to see us it would be nice to see us um, maybe bring in Kirchhoff and Larson next week and see whether we can play through a bit more because um, Defoe today when he was on goals on Sunday for instance spoke about how um, David Moyes is very meticulous with his training methods and he does a lot of possession stuff everything is pretty much based on possession in fact Defoe said that I can tell he spent time in Spain because all we do in training is possession drills um, but then in games we're not seeing it because maybe the <laughs> midfielders aren't good enough to do that so well, it would be nice to about, see that you know it would be nice on about the midfielders like uh Denayer, I mean, what do you think about him, Tom? Because I, I, I personally think for the last two games he's he's been a, a, a bit of a minor revelation. I'm gonna s- skirt the topic but come back to it because the issue for me with the likes of PNR and Jason Denayer is it's square pegs in round holes. Mm. Jason, Jason Denayer, don't get me great play and he's fitted, he's slotted into this sort of holding midfield role, and he was superb when he was put. Um, in like a man marking role against Coutinho, he was fantastic and maybe struggled a little bit up until uh, after Coutinho went off because he wasn't 100 percent sure what he was doing. But ultimately, we're asking a central defender to play a holder midfielder, and we're asking a 35, 36 year old former left winger to play as a box to box midfielder. Now I know we've been uh, sort of hit by this injury crisis, and Catmull's out for another four months, and McNair looks like he's going to be out for a certain amount of time. And obviously Larson and Kirchhoff are to come back, <laughs> and that's on, that, that's a huge problem. Yeah, when, when you say it, it kind of argues for itself, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, oh, and I, <laughs> I get that's like a massive. That is a massive issue, but it's not as if we came into the season 
oblivious to the fact that Lee Catamol, Sebastian Larson was struggling with injuries. It's not as if we didn't know Jan Kirchhoff was somebody who wasn't going to see sort of 30 games in a season. So to me, I, I, I'm not 100% certain why we went out and got somebody like Adnan Yanazai, for example, if we're not going to play with wingers and we're desperate for a box-to-box midfielder. So to me, this this whole issue of, don't get me wrong, Denai was superb, definitely. And nobody's saying that PNR's not trying. Maybe we're just saying he's a little bit too old now to fulfil that role. But it just highlights a serious issue with the club, in all honesty, and that's something Gary Bennett and Nick Barnes have mentioned a couple of times on BBC Newcastle, is we just don't have the money to bring in the players to compete with the likes of Liverpool, unfortunately. And I don't know what the other lads think, but it's a little bit worrying. And to have to, like I said, to have to utilise a central defender in that midfield role, it's worrying. <laughs> it really well, is. yeah, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the trouble with that, you've, re- you've raised a point that could like cover an entire 10 episodes of this podcast. That's the only issue we've got, isn't it? But yeah, I, I would completely agree with you. Obviously, that is a troubling a troubling matter. I'm, at the same time, though, I mean, we're actually going to what you said about Yanazai, that's a very valid point. I, I don't rate him, certainly not in this system, that Moyes is trying to... Uh, to utilise him in is that a sound of like well it, was a, it wasn't even panic buying was it it was like a panic loan Do you know and th- I suppose that itself is indicative of the uh, of the lack of money that Moyes clearly was aware was going on no, I think so well, he, went, we've he went into it knowing we, that we've already highlighted that Moyes is obviously a very loyal person and mm. obviously he must get on with Yanazai and he obviously he trusts him from his Man United days so that's I think that's the only reason he's brought him in is, you know, it, because he thinks this may be a player who could, you know, do something special. Um, I I doubt that. I don't think the lad wants to be a footballer. Um, I just I don't think he 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 has the right mentality to be a Premier League footballer at all. I think that the wages we're spending on him are probably significant, and that certainly can be used. Um, do we, do we think they're significant though? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, there must, there there must, is going to be a significant amount of wages, or do you think that be on to man you? Yeah, 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 that's true, that's true. It's nothing to scoff at, but at the same time, when you consider that... But if you're saying, Pono, if you're saying that we can't, to we can't do afford, anything... If we can't afford um, Jan and Villa, then, you know, by not having someone like... That was 100k, though, wasn't what, it? What's, what's that saying in football? There's there's no friends in football, there's only acquaintances. You know, mm. that for me, in January, when, when the chips were down and we didn't have the squad that we needed, now the dice needed to go out and get more players... Did he go out and get Joey O'Brien and Kevin Nolan? No. He went out and he got the players who he needed to play in the positions that he that he wanted. And mm. that, to me, is a significant difference. Um, and that's something that, fair enough, if he's a loyal person, I mean, I, I don't necessarily want the person who manages my who manages my team to be the nicest guy in the world. I just I don't think I want him to be the nicest guy in the world. Well, no, no, but but it's you know I I don't necessarily mind if. If he's if he's loyal and oh isn't that nice he's given Stephen Pienaar a retirement present I mean I I I want Stephen Pienaar to be good, good point, I want him it? I want him to be good enough to play for Sunderland or I don't want him to be here now I realise there are limitations and obviously there's limitations on time and money and he's got to wheel and deal and you know that's why we've got players like Denier playing where he's playing and why Paddy McNair's had to go out on the the left and and so I sympathise to an extent but at the same time. I do think that his his loyalty, um, like like Gav said, gets the better of him and will get the better of him on on several uh, occasions this do you not season. Think, do you not think that someone like Stephen Pino has actually been one of our better players this year? Though at times, I mean, he has been good. I certainly wouldn't say loyalty he's shown towards someone like Stephen Pino has, has been his downfall this year at all. I think Stephen Pino has offered more than. A lot of the a lot of the players. I think have... it's been a very it's been a very low bar though, hasn't it? I mean, it's like it's it, it, fair enough. He's like he's he's, he's it's established also his himself as Callum, isn't it? Because he apparently Stephen P. I think it was Nick Barnes again who said this on one of the um, on the I think it was the Wise Men Say Live podcast. Who's Stephen P. is the one who when we were even getting beat, he's the one screaming at people in the changing room. And that's he's absolutely been maybe yeah. this mentality and experience that he obviously sees. That a young squad like ours needs. I think we're giving. That's, a- that's absolutely that's absolutely fine. His presence in the in the changing room is absolutely fine. Why is he playing 
on the left wing for 75 minutes against Liverpool. Yeah, that's, my, that's my that's my that's <laughs> my I I don't think he's, <laughs> he's necessarily cleared a, a very high bar. He's been he, he has been he has put in performances that have, that have elevated him above other summer signings, but that hasn't been necessarily but uh, do you not too think, difficult. But do you not I think mean, that David Moyes when he when he signed Stephen Pienaar, this was this was someone who thought right. He's a solid squad player. He might play in cup games and he might play the odd match. But obviously, because of the injury crisis, he's had to play more. Um, I and, don't... Lo- and loaning out and loaning out Lens and benching Kazri and you know there, honest, there are. The whole, I reckon that, that well, we could we Kazri... could argue. I'll, I'll have to interrupt the periods because we could argue about this all day. But we have a finite time limit, so take it to Twitter, lads. <laughs> tweet live about this continuing he's get, argument. He's, he's getting blocked. After, he's getting blocked after this. He's not got me on Twitter. That's it. No friend of mine. <laughs> Right. Talking about Twitter, we've got uh, some questions as usual for you. Um, uh, keeping slightly uh, to the tone, uh, we've got a question from Gerard McElroy. Who asks, are we expecting too much from players coming into a Liverpool game? And as a side note, he says, or did Adnan Yanazai look poor? Obviously, we've covered the Yanazai bit, but I think that's a very um, that's a very poignant question. That's a, Do we expect too much of players coming into a game like that? What do you think, Gav? Um Completely. I mean, I, I wrote something about it after the game on the site, um, just regarding some of the some of the stuff people were saying about uh, and Dong and Watmore in particular, because um, I found, well, I find, especially in the case of these two players, I find that um, there seems to be a growing, very vocal um, group of fans who who just seem to. Whenever things don't necessarily go right, in fact, when they do go right, because what what more played fine against Hull and he played fine against Bournemouth, and even then I was seeing criticism of his performance and Ndong's performance, and I felt that neither of them, uh, though they didn't play well, I, I couldn't say who really did in our team, um, but both of them uh, worked their socks off, and, and they're always there, they're always shown, they both want the ball, they both want to get stuck in and help, yet they're seen as some sort of scapegoat when we don't win games, and and that was particularly evident after the Liverpool game. I mean, we got beat two nil, and Don gave a penalty away. What more? Um, I don't think it was as guilt edged a chance as some will make out. It was, it was, it was a chance, but it wasn't, it wasn't as easy as Pinar's, for instance. And people don't seem to be focusing so much on that. Um, I do think that you've got to remember who we played. They went top of the league when they beat us. Um, they're scoring more goals than any team in the Premier League. Uh, they, they've taken apart better sides than we have than we are at Anfield this season already. And we turned up, and for a large portion of that game, uh, were very competitive and and looked for a time capable of at least taking a point. And and to then after the game, when when things haven't gone our way necessarily, to, to start picking faults with players who. Uh, would never go to stand out in this fixture because we just do not have that quality of player outside of maybe two or three names. Uh, I find that quite, quite disheartening. I think I think there's there's players like Ndong and Watmore who are given their all and want to clearly impress that need the fans to show them a little bit more love and it's not going to help picking out picking them out and 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 pulling the, the performances apart on the back. On the back of a daft tackle, which, to be honest, and Dong had no choice but to make. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, uh, yeah, and what more? And what more was a half chance, and, and yet was sat was sat defend them because people feel that they were. It's another excuse to to pull them a bit, and it was against a very top side. So yeah, they, for I me, mean, mm-hmm. go on, sir. Go on, I mean, the Ndong, like people getting on and Dong's back. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous the amount of abuse he's been getting on social media. So people saying that he offers absolutely nothing. He's a headless chicken. He can't move the ball well. I, I actually thought he was. I had his arguably his best game in the Sunderland shirt. He's given away a penalty, but I think Jermaine Defoe said it on goals on Sunday. I mean, Mane is so quick. The lad's a young. He's a young professional, isn't he? So you, you can't be too harsh on him. I think he's done. He's he's had a decent. He's had a decent, decent start to the season. You know, all things considered. Well, well, there again. If, I mean, I don't, I'm not a big proponent of stats as backing up arguments, but even if you do look at um, the stats that have come out of the game and, and, and from and Dong, they're nowhere near as bad as people would expect. You know, he was one of our top passers, I think, 
Pickford and Van Aanholt made more other than him. Nobody else did. He completed 15 out of 19 passes. Not bad, really, considering we were on the back foot a lot of the game. Um, and they pressured you know, the ball so much as well. Yeah, and four, four of his five passes in the attack and third were completed. You're, you're talking about a decent midfield performance, all things considered. All right, he's not going to end the season in double figures when you add his assists and goals together, but I think his job in the side is very similar to the one Jan and Villa played last year. Maybe not to the same level because and Villa is a far more experienced footballer, but and Villa only scored once last season, you know, and he and he and you don't see people pulling them pulling him apart for that. I think we've got to just be more patient and uh-huh. yes, he cost us a lot of money, but at the end of the day, does it really matter? He's still a young lad playing in the Premier League first season, learn learn his trade, you know? Yeah, I think and, we, and what we said what we said earlier, I think Callum mentioned it where we, you know, we've, we've bypassed midfield a lot this season anyway. We've, we've not really played the ball through midfield. So to have him, he, he's never going to stand out that much, is he, in a team that barely yeah. played through the middle? Well, now, oh, now no. Paddy McNair is, is out for, for probably the season. If we can get players like Kirchhoff and, and Catamol, obviously Catamol's out for a bit longer, and, and Larson's coming back as well, what would everyone think about Ndong potentially moving out to a further left position to cover Van Arnold because he's got an engine, you know, he's, he can press, he can he can cover for Van Arnold, and potentially you can sort of remove him from the centre when we get players back and and put him uh, out wide wide left and do the job that McNair seemed to be doing in those in those games against Bournemouth and Hull. I think he's he's definitely got a lot of uh, potential. He's he's a he's you know I I thought he's been on several games he's been uh, a very tidy player. He's he's kept the ball. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's just kind of been, you know, passing it about, keeping the ball moving, working some openings. He's not spectacular, but, you know, you need a, you do need a player like that, and and uh, and I, I agree that people are being far too, uh, far too harsh. I and mean, he's had a few wobbles. He's, had, you know, the game against West Ham, he was not good at all. Um, he was, he was very poor. But by and large, he's, he's, in my opinion, by no means disgraced himself. And. And uh, and and I I think there is a, you know it's a very vocal minority I think who are who are getting on his back and and what more's as well and and it and it is uncalled for I think definitely the ir- there's an irony to it though that we're just as harsh with Duncan Watmore who we acquired as like a young rough gem as we are to somebody who we spent 13 million on and I think one thing that needs addressing to some fans is. They say, oh, well, we spent 13 million on Ndong and we expect him to perform straight away. We didn't spend 13 million on Ndong. We will come to spend up to 13 million on Ndong. But for now, we've probably given them next to nothing. In all honesty, it's not as if the club has stumped up 13 million pounds, given it to um, Lorion and said, okay, here's 13 million for Ndong. It's an investment and we have to kind of treat it that way. The fact that yeah. we're trying to pay for him over t- uh, an amount of time suggests that he isn't the finished article that we've purchased. We've bought someone who's thought of very highly for a young man. It's, it's only 22, 23, about the same age as Pickford and what more. And fans expect him to be like, like you said, Yanam Vila or uh, Paul Pogba or somebody like that from the sounds of things. And it's, it's unfair. And uh, Gav brought this up a couple of times in a few episodes past saying, we probably wouldn't have expected him to play this much. And there was a few people who poo-pooed that. But if you actually listen to a few of the people who are kind of in the know almost, uh, so to speak, they've all said that, we, like I said, we haven't spent $13 million on him. We've, we've almost put a down payment for a quality player for years to come. So for me, it's, it's just this really irritable... And you're right, it's a minority, but unfortunately it's like this idiotic minority who have giant gobs and little brains... And they're all screaming and shouting at the likes of Watmore and Adong. And I see people ripping into Pickford yesterday as well, saying that he, he, his distribution was garbage. And I'm just thinking, are you blind? Or, you know, are you, are you, just, that. Are you just being daft? And I'm just thinking, you've got, <laughs> it, it's an awful situation to be in with such a big injury crisis. But we're asking 22 to 23-year-olds to step up and go toe-to-toe with some of the world's best players. Give your head a wobble. Oh, These well, lads are doing absolutely brilliantly for the position they're being put in. Did you did you see the um the the, the showed some of the highlights when Defoe was talking through the game with uh, the lads on goals on Sunday and and they showed a, a ball that I'm totally forgetting about actually Pickford played over the top 
from a, from his hands and it landed unreal, right, I landed right on Defoe's boot, and then I'm, I, I saw the same crack that Tom did. People criticised his distribution. There wasn't many. Like I did, it was maybe a couple of comments on social media. But come on, man, when you, you see when Defoe you see him says, doing stuff like that, Defoe, Defoe goes and says that's he's arguably the best with distribution he's played with. Like I mean, if I, if Defoe's saying that, I mean Pickford's obviously unreal. They, Can I make one quick point on? Um, Jurgen Klopp, I don't know if you any well, but you'll have all seen what he said afterwards. But Sunderland were probably the most defensive team he's ever seen in his entire life. I thought he's, he's he can jog on. I mean, what's he expect Sunderland to turn up and play open football like Watford did and be three 0 down within twenty minutes? D- didn't this <laughs> didn't this happen? Didn't this happen a couple of years ago against Liverpool as well? Wasn't Brendan Rodgers saying the same thing about us? I know. It's just um, I think we we rattled them. We did <clears throat> totally. That's like what, like what I said at the start. The the fact that he was charging up and down the line, telling the Liverpool fans to start cheering. You know what I mean? That he's never been that rattled all season, and that's maybe what it was. He he he's been so used, and maybe they they have as well to an extent, which is why they were booing, well, um, moaning on and groaning, and um, they've been so used to teams turning up there and just turning over and and not being able to to take what they can offer. That when Sunderland drop up and and largely frustrate them. I say frustrate, it wasn't like they were bombing Pickford with shots. They, they, they weren't playing very well. So many misplaced passes and things like that. The, the set pieces were rubbish. Um, so the, they contributed to their own issues, really, and it was and it was a bit of quality which won them the game at the end of the day. I mean, you've got to discount the penalty, really. The game was lost by that point. It was it was largely innocuous. Um, and it, it wasn't an insult, though, was it? I didn't take it as that. A lot of people have turned around, like like what James said, like, well, what do you think we were going to do? Like, fuck off. But in reality, I don't think it was an insult. I mean, it seemed more like he was desperately trying, well, not desperately trying, because he didn't really have to desperately try to do anything after they eventually got the three points. But uh, maybe as a sort of uh, defence against the fans or criticism against the the way the team played in general what, what you, and, and, and it's the truth isn't it it's the point it, we were incredibly defensive because we knew what we were going to get ourselves into we, we, we were defensive and it was, Damien it was, but, but on the other side bombardment. like we did create a couple of chances and we we certainly weren't like I didn't few and far between though yeah they were few and far between we were de- we were that the whole game plan clearly from start to finish, was to sit back, park the bus, double hope bus. that Defoe and what more could go and yeah. But if, if Klopp's not trying to be. I think we probably take things to heart maybe a little bit too much. All he's trying to do there is take the onus off the fact that his players couldn't break down a bottom three team at home in mm. front of a crowd. So the smart thing for any manager to do, and maybe we haven't seen this enough from David Moyes, but is is for him to step up and point the finger at somebody else. Mourinho is an absolute genius at it. He comes out and takes all the flack from the media and it lets his players play. Sam Allardyce you know, did it time after time he, last year and Klopp's haven't a resort to it. And in a way, it's smart. I mean, you know, annoy the Sunderland fans, get the press talking about, oh, well, you know, we're Sunderland, just dreadful, etc., etc. Take the shine off the fact that Liverpool for 75 minutes couldn't break down a team that are in the bottom three. I think Mourinho did it a few weeks ago. He said Man United are the, are the unluckiest team in the Premier yeah. League. And mm-hmm. then everyone, all the press could ask was, are Man United the Yorkies? And started looking at loads of t- statistics and started yeah. sort of pouring over that instead of looking at the performance that they just put in. And it, like you said, it, it is, uh, I think we do have to take it as a bit of a compliment that we rattled them and we got under their skin and, and we didn't just, you know, roll over and then at the end he's coming out going, oh, well, you know, I thought they tried really hard and they did really well. And, you know, I think they're going to be absolutely fine this season. These kind of empty compliments that you get. So... Yeah, just take it as a compliment, I would say, and 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 you know we managed to get we managed to get under his skin when he's usually sort of really laid back and you know presents himself as kind of Agreed, a cool, yeah. easy guy. So, yeah, definitely. Well, speaking of uh, world class managers, I suppose you could say we've got Leicester coming up next. How's everyone feeling about that? Because obviously they're not the force they were, but they they're still there's still too much quality there to to really hope well no what am I talking about we've always got hope but there's still too much quality there to go with anything more than the the sort of tempered yeah. uh, potential optimism that we took in the Liverpool game like maybe we can take something I, from this I think so like I definitely yeah. think so it's not the same Leicester mm. team that, that we played at the end of last season that we're no, going no, to the definitely. title um, 
you you got to remember, it took a late penalty for them to get a point against Middlesbrough this weekend. Before that, they were beaten by Watford. Before that, they were beaten by West Brom. Before that, they drew with Spurs. And the last victory came against Palace, who I think even we would beat Palace convincingly if we played them tomorrow. So um, I think I think that we've just got to kind of go into this game with a more positive mentality. It's like it's like I said earlier. I think I think the fact we lost this weekend is is um, completely irrelevant at this point. We have two games coming up now, which we are more than capable of winning if we apply ourselves the way we did this weekend. Um, and and most importantly of all is the fact that we have players returning. Leicester obviously aren't as confident um, because of the results that the that they're achieving. And on top of that, uh, I saw a really weird stat. Uh, apparently, Jamie Vardy hasn't received a pass from Riyad Mahrez in September in the Premier League. Um, I don't have a clue what that's about, but it obviously shows that whatever they were doing last season isn't work in this I season think, yeah, um, yeah, and, and, and I'm more than happy I'm more than happy for us to set up in a way which will we'll try and attack them I think we're, we're I think, more capable of scoring goals yeah everything's not rosy in the garden there I think and it's um, it's the, the, I think Jamie Vardy's probably sort of um, he, he looks like he's maybe huffing a bit Mares as well they're trying to balance the European commitment that they've clearly gotten and trying to rotate their squad but Obviously, if they rotate their squad, they have to play a slightly different way. They've got Slomani up front, so they have to kind of adjust their game plan and play a different way. They're missing Drinkwater. They're missing Schmeichel. Their defence looks um, less confident with the with the goalkeeper, with Zila in goal instead of Schmeichel. Um, they just look they look tired every time they play in the Premier League and, and their schedule is, is catching up with them. So I think that you, we've got them at a low point... Uh, Key players missing, players out of form, and we need to take advantage of that and and ask questions of of their defence, of the goalkeeper, um, and and you know like like we did against Liverpool, you know really rattle players like uh, like Vardy, like like Mares, and and you know try and and try and be competitive because if we if we do that, they've shown this season that they are gonna they they do give away points. They're not as as ruthless as they were last season, so. I think there's definitely points up for grabs if we're willing to to go out and and take them. I'd agree. I think Callum's spot on. I think I think we've been. They're certainly not the same team defensively since obviously the changes in rules. They've not been able to like manhandle people in the box. They've not looked as solid. Um, Mares hasn't looked the same player at all. I'd actually think maybe maybe they just they're prioritising the Champions League so much now. You know they they want this magic carpet ride, if you will. Um, to continue and they see that obviously they're not going to beat last season are they in terms of Premier League they're, they know they're not going to retain their title and they know it's a once in a generation that you go and win the league um, so they're probably trying to put all their eggs in the Champions League basket and try and push on as far as they can in that and they're almost I think they are yeah. aren't they didn't they wasn't didn't Ranieri come out with that at the beginning of the season anyway that the Champions League was going to be the focus for this season which he can't he, he himself didn't believe that well I mean yeah there's a sort of nobility to it isn't there imagine if they did pull that off but they could go it's down it's sort of like saying like yeah yeah they could but what again there's a nobility to it isn't there how amazing would that be to the, imagine the props forever for fans yeah but don't forget we won the league and then we won the Champions League after that so suck it I can see their whole point you know what I mean I can see, and sort of maybe questioning their resources I mean yes there, there was an argument I mean they haven't been bought out have they they're still under the same ownership so it's not like they won the Premier League and then some Man City style owner comes in and goes boom Yes, I'll take that and feed you all of this money and give you everything you need, all of the tools and resources to continually challenge for the title. They they stayed the same. Their their income may have gone up slightly, their revenue, but only as a a temporary thing, just as, as temporary as any any uh, small well not smaller club, but you know what I mean, a, a lesser known club yeah. winning the title just once. I was listening to six um, at six. Uh, yesterday, and there were uh, a couple of Leicester fans are coming on. Some of the Leicester fans are getting a bit, uh, getting a bit impatient, and they're actually calling for Ranieri's head. They're saying he's 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 his tactical now is is not is not there. He's making poor substitutions, but a lot of the other fans are saying that, you know, look, if we finish mid table this season, that's 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 probably where we belong. You know, last season was a complete fluke. Um, they're just they're a mid table side. 
I don't. They don't worry me at all. If you, Leicester at home, bring them on. Fair enough. Oof, bold statement. Any anyone disagree with that, <clears throat> Tom? Do you do you have an argument against? I don't know if I disagree with it, but if you just look at our upcoming fixtures, and I'll I'll say this ahead of time: twenty second of April, Arsenal at home. That's when the the great escape kicks into the final days. I bet you from <laughs> from that day on, because then we've got Bournemouth at home, Hull away, Swansea at home. And Chelsea at home, last game of the season. It's always Chelsea, isn't it? It is. I mean, uh, I just have a, a good feeling saying that. <laughs> but if you look at our stats, uh, sorry, our stats, our fixtures coming up, obviously we've got Leicester at home next week and then Swansea away. If you can perform in those, those two games and then go into that, bit of, that mental Christmas period where anything can happen, you give yourself a, a really good fighting chance, I think. And Swansea did quality this weekend. That 5-4 win was was uh, an absolute joy to watch for me personally. But I just think for, for Sunderland, it's it's a case of taking it, like we said, one game at a time, not getting too carried away. Any team on any day is beatable. Um, we just need to play it to our strengths. The one thing I would say I was a little bit disappointed with David Moyes was if you look at the aerial duels on, on, on like any stats website, Victor Anichebe was like top of the list. He was really, really good in the air. And we, we didn't take a gamble on him, putting him central after, uh, after Liverpool either got the goal or even sort of leading up to that goal to act as more of an outlet. That was a, a little bit disappointing to me. And I think you know we're going to come up against Leicester with Robert Huth and Wes Morgan at the back. Um, we're going to have to reassess what our strength is going to be, whether Anichibi is going to be effective out on the left. Are we going to utilise him as much as we want? Because he, he, he's going to be up against two real boisterous, um, rambunctious, Damien's favourite word, uh, centre-backs. Okay. So it's going to be really, really interesting just to see how David Moyes looks at this game and sort of analyses what it is that we need to do. And I, I don't know if, what the other lads think, but um, with Kirchhoff and Larson sort of coming back to match availability with regard to their fitness. Are there any changes anybody would make? The, does what more and Dong need a little breather? Uh, what does anybody think? I, I, I would say that if it, it it all probably hinges on how they do for the under 23s should the play. But if, if Seb Larson can do anything in the game this midweek, um, like what he did against Man United last week, where he looked very capable and fit, albeit on a small stage against a very young team. He looked fit and he looked ready. Um, if he can prove that again, then he would be straight in the team for me because he, we just lack somebody like that who harries and, and organises in the middle. And I think I think we haven't really had a standout central midfield performance so far this season. And it's, it's maybe when you've got the options there, the time to start changing. But um, as a more rounded point, I'd just maybe, maybe finish off on this, is that uh, though we lost this weekend, it's it's critical really that we try and take positives out of the defeat and and look at how um, maybe in comparison to the Arsenal game which was only a few weeks ago how much better we looked against a top team how much more organised we look how much more up for it we looked we look more hungry yeah. we look more like we were, were in it, it looks as though the players have realised what they're in for now and they're starting to get used to each other and, and ultimately ultimately um, <laughs> with Leicester and Swansea to come get there in the end <laughs> with Leicester and Swansea to come um, I, I do I do know that I think it was Jason Denea said after the whole game that Moyes had told the players we have to win these next two games and we did Bournemouth and Hull um, I think he's probably looking at the next two and saying the same because there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why we cannot come out of either of those games with three points, in my opinion. And I think, I think you've got to you've got to stick. What what we, we've looked all right in the last few weeks, um, particularly going forward. Maybe not so much at the weekend because we were restricted in in so many words. But you look at Leicester play Danny Simpson right back, and you think of Anichebe's best performances have come up against fullbacks a lot smaller, and you've got to stick him there, and you've got to really target him, and you've got to try and get fouls out of him and maybe just maybe hope that in each week can put in another good home performance and we'll get three points and like I say Leicester are not unbeatable it's been shown on many occasions already this season that they've clearly got their eyes focused on the Champions League um, and away trip to Sunderland probably doesn't rank anywhere near as high on that list of fixtures the one that they're looking forward to this season and in, in, in our eyes we we are desperate for points we're bottom of the league again <clears throat> it's another backs of the wall performance that we need and, and I'm to be honest, I'm, although we are bottom of the league, um, 
I've seen signs of encouragement and I've seen enough to show that we can get something and I'm I'm pretty hopeful. I'm pretty hopeful. Well, you can take a breath now, Gav. Awesome. I, I agree with you as well, actually. To that. You know yeah. me. We can, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, well, yeah, unfortunately that is uh, all we've got time for. Let's hope Gav's right and we can take all the best from next week. Obviously, don't forget to join us and we'll we'll be reporting on that, as it were, or bemoaning it or happy and drunk or something like that I don't know you'll have to find out next week basically you can subscribe to us on uh, iTunes don't forget you can download the Acast app as well and that's it from me and the lads Uh, this is Robert Paul signing off